Salam alaikum. Welcome to Marriage Matters, Tools for a Healthy Relationship. And this is session one, Communication 101. So this is brought to you by Peaceful Families Project. Peaceful Families Project is an organization, it's a 501c3, so it's a nonprofit that is headquartered in Virginia. However, it reaches national and international, um, has national and international impact. And Basically, it's an initiative that's devoted to ending domestic violence in Muslim families by facilitating awareness workshops for Muslim leaders and communities, providing cultural sensitivity trainings and technical assistance for professionals. They do a lot of research and develop resources that can be used by various community organizations and members to be able to really um, fight against domestic violence and encourage the development and fostering of healthy relationships in our community. Okay. And so a little about the trainers, Onaiza. Assalamu alaikum everyone. It's so good to see you all. So good to see so many familiar faces. MashaAllah, my Tampa people. Uh, and welcome to everybody else also. Uh, as Dina said, if you could please, if you would are comfortable turning your camera on, we'd love to see all of you. It makes it a more enriching experience. Um, so I will introduce the trainers. So first we have the lovely Dina Halmi, who is from Orange County, California. So she is joining most of us from a different time zone. And um, Dina has a master's degree in counseling and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist. She works with the County and Behavioral Health Services uh, Department as a clinical training coordinator. And she's also the Director of Counseling Services at IGNA Relief California. And then Dina also on the side does private practice, private practice specifically focusing on premarital counseling. So mashallah, she wears a lot of hats. Uh, for fun, Dina likes to do board games and hiking, which California is the perfect place for that and enjoys bonfires. <laughs> Um, and then secondly, it's me, Oneza, Oneza Malik. I have a master's degree in mental health counseling with a, a specialty in marriage and family therapy. I reside in Tampa, Florida, which is home, which is where I grew up. I currently work in the private practice sector, uh, seeing individuals, couples, families, children uh, for anxiety, depression, you name it. Um, and I love my work. I love what I do and for fun. Um, and what I enjoy is I love to travel and anything with mountains and water is my place to be. I love nature. So we're so, so excited to be with all of you today. And that's perfect too for you for being in Florida, right? You get yes. nature and water, alhamdulillah. Um, okay, yes, thank you so much, Unaiza, for that. So just to give you guys a little bit of, a, of an overview of what we'll be doing today, um, we're going to have a couple of segments, if you will. So we will have a little bit of an overview where we're going to do a little bit more, if you will, the lecture portion, where it'll be a lot of information that's being shared um, by both myself, by both me and Unaiza. And then we're going to have an interactive portion um, where you get to kind of put the skills into practice. And then we'll, we'll regroup again, kind of debrief um, on some things and open it up for questions and answers. So along the way, if you do have questions, please feel free to jot them down. Um, you can put them in the chat if you want or just save them for the Q&A portion. We will be facilitating that and getting to it, inshallah. Okay, so why does communication matter? Um, this is really one of the, the, the reasons that inspired Uneza and I to partner up and, you know, under the Peaceful Families Project umbrella, um, come together and bring this series. When they look at the four top reasons for divorce, many of you may have, you know, may know people who actually got divorced for any of, or any of these reasons or combinations thereof, but infidelity, disagreements over money, poor communication, and constant arguing. And the common denominator in all of those, for the most part, is communication. So that's why we know how impactful communication can be um, in really promoting healthy relationships. And that's why we're offering these series. So how easy is communication? And these are just some two little funny <laughs> pictures, but you know, Cookie Monster, they're saying, what? You're saying there's more to communication than I want cookie? Like it's, no, that's, how interesting is that? 
or you've got a dog and a cat trying to talk and they're just like, they're communicating and it's what, does he realize how difficult he sounds? So it's like, we're speaking a different language. So this is the part where we'll do a little activity. If you can pull out that sheet of paper um, that you were asked to, to have on board. And for this activity, what you'll do, normally if we were all in the same room, everybody would kind of close their eyes and just, you know, follow instructions and then kind of compare notes at the end. Um, but since we're all in separate places, I will ask you to just um, work on whatever it is you're working on without it being visible to the camera. So the sheet of paper that you have, I'm gonna give you a list of steps, of instructions, of things to do so that we can see how good of a communicator you think you are. And here's the cool part. I told you all to grab a sheet of paper and guess who did not grab a sheet of paper? <laughs> Me. But luckily I have one handy. Okay. Always just to see. See, I didn't even inspect my own communication. Okay. So I'm gonna read a, a set of instructions and you'll just kind of follow them. Um, you, you're not able to ask any questions during this process. And like I said, you're not able to see what other people are doing. Okay. So this exercise will require listening and following directions. Okay. Number one, fold your sheet of paper in half. Number two, tear off the upper right corner. Number three, fold your paper in half again. Number four, tear off the lower right corner. Number five, fold your paper in half again. Number six, tear off the upper left corner. Number seven, okay, I can't even do this. <laughs> fold in half a final time. Number eight, tear off the lower left corner. And then, I can't even do this. Number nine, unfold your paper and hold it up. I gotta do this one thing. So unfold your paper and hold it up. And let's see what we have. I'm trying to hold it up to the camera. I don't know. Oh, so what happens when you're using virtual backgrounds. Okay. Does it look like any of us have the same? I don't know. How do I do this? Okay. So there's a couple that maybe look a little bit similar, some that look different. So when we look at this, we wonder why does why didn't everyone's look exactly the same? So what went wrong? And it's not necessarily that it was wrong because there's not necessarily a right way to do it. But what were some of the challenges? And when we look at it, we know that we have a sender and receiver in communication. So we're not even in the same room. Okay, so there, there's that element where we're not closely connected as a sender and receiver. Feedback, normally if you were all together, if we were all there and our eyes were open, you'd be able to see what other people, you'd be able to see what I was doing as the person who's giving the instructions and you'd be able to see what other people's looked like. And that always gives us a sense of feedback, like, am I on the right track? Am I getting it? Am I not? And then finally, clarifying questions. You weren't able to ask questions. So do you think that if you were able to ask questions in the process, would that have made it um, a little easier, if you will, in order to get us all on the same page? Probably yes. <laughs> okay. And so when we look at miscommunication, when we look at communication mistake mistakes or like what causes miscommunication, there are four common themes that tend to happen. So number one, using you language directives. Number two, using universal statements. Number three, being tough on the person, soft on the issue. And number four, invalidating feelings. We'll get into each one of these um, right now. 
So you language directives are statements that pass negative judgment or order another person around. You've probably heard this, you know, be said to you. A lot of times we hear it as children um, where it's like, you should pay attention or you need to do this right now. When we hear, when, when we're the recipient of the you language direct, directive, we feel, we get defensive. When someone says like, you need to, like the automatic reaction is kind of just like, you know, no, I'm not, or like make me or says who, or th there's this element of defensiveness that comes out and also a sense of resentment. It's kind of like, you can almost feel like the eyes rolling, like, oh, like again. And it really invites a no response. So the person who's receiving the you directive doesn't even want to engage, right? Because it's just like, they blow it off. Who cares? It's not going to help anyways. Um, doesn't really matter. The next one, the universal statements. And just like the word says universal, so it's kind of like all, <laughs> we're applying it to everything. Um, and these tend to generalize a character or behavior, usually in a negative way. Um, sometimes in a positive or they're just like, oh, you're always so nice. And usually in relationships, that's like in the beginning. And then later on, it's like, <laughs> you always leave the toilet seat up or you never put the toothpaste cap back on. Um, you didn't take out the trash again. And so, you know, you forget to do this every time. You're such a, and then fill in the blank. And the challenge here is the person who is giving this, who's saying these um, sentences or, or making these statements doesn't really let, doesn't hold the space for the other person to show up in a different light, right? It's really focusing on what's negative, what's wrong, and it can easily be disputed. If someone says, you didn't take out the trash again, or you never take out the trash. And I sit there and I think like, well, I did take it out like, yeah, three weeks ago, but I found one incident that just negates the entire thing. It kind of, you know, blows it out. We're kind of going over all the things that like, these are the, the not to do things before we segue into the other section of what to do. So it's always easy to identify these because they tend to be very common and we've all either engaged in them in some form or been the recipients of it. So tough on the person, soft on the issue. So in every um, interaction that we have with others, there's two elements. There's a person we're dealing with and there is, um, th there's a, a situation. And it's a person and the behavior, right? And we see this a lot. This kind of applies to all types of um, interactions that we have, even when we're dealing with children, um, as teachers, as parents, it can be applied as well. We look at it where we have to be able to separate the person from the issue. So if a child, for example, um, made a poor decision, if I go to them and I just say, you're so careless, like you always do this, you, you know, you again didn't do this one thing, or you, you weren't, you never use your brain, like what are you, do you have no brain? Versus like, you're a smart kid and you weren't making a smart choice at this time, right? So it's, we still accept the person. Our partner, for example, didn't clean up and it's, you never clean up versus I noticed you didn't wash the dishes this week. And so it becomes, we're able to then, you know, still acknowledge the other person that they have feelings, that they are um, a respectable person and separate it from the issue. We may have an issue with, with the behavior, but how do we communicate that where we have the issue with the behavior, but we're still okay with a person. Here the challenge becomes that it really makes the other person resistant, resentful, and angry. Um, and obviously it's not facilitating a healthy interaction. And then finally, we have invalidating feelings. And this is when it's important for us to recognize that emotions, whether they're positive or negative, come out of a person. They either discount, we're discounting, belittling, minimizing, or negatively judging the feelings. Um, so if someone, for example, says, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I really messed up. Actually, I'm trying to think of like a good example. If we say, for example, um, you're overreacting. If someone gets mad and it's kind of just like, you know, you always do this, you're overreacting. Like it's not that big of a deal. Well, for the person who is experiencing all those feelings, like it probably was a big deal. For someone to turn around and say, it's not a big deal. Like, why are you overreacting? It's making it seem as if they're not valid. Like their feeling of being, you know, frustrated or feeling um, hurt in that moment is not validated. And so it really creates a distance between the two people. 
And this is oftentimes when, when people's negative feelings get invalidated, like if I'm hurt or I'm angry and the other person in front of me like never sees that or doesn't understand where it may be coming from, I may just give up on the relationship and just be like, you know what, it's never going to change, who cares, and start distancing. And that's where we see a lot of fallouts tend to happen. So all of these four miscommunication or very um, issues with communication, what are the consequences? So people tend to react to those three um, issues in three ways. Some people will fight. They'll just keep fighting, right? They'll, they'll get very, um, they'll just start arguing and they, they start to confront it and it becomes like, they basically will start fighting with the other person. Another consequence is flight. They'll just, they'll peace out. They'll leave. They'll cut off that relationship. They will, um, they'll just, they don't want to deal with it. And then finally, some people will freeze. They just shut down in that moment. And um, because they don't, they don't really know what to say. So they kind of just keep it in, but they're not able to respond in a healthy way. And all of these basically um, can really impact a relationship. And so we're going to shift gears slightly and we look at intimate conversations, right? This is kind of like part of the part where we wanna you know, build these tools for healthy relationships. We wanna learn how to have an intimate conversation, which we're gonna to get to shortly. Um, but the elements or the components of an intimate conversation are three. It consists of you, me, and a feeling, okay? So it's, it's the person, the other person, and then the feeling and all the feelings that come up for both of those people, right? But if we look at the feeling as part of the conversation, that's really what guides it. And so in the next slide, we're going to watch a little video. So if you are able to, um, once I push play, if you can hear it, then just kind of give me a thumbs up so I know that you're able to watch it. But it's going to be of a couple. It's a little, you might find it. Well, I'll let you decide for how you find it. But I want you to pay attention to the moments where um, the types of reactions or the types of responses that create more of um, more of a clash and what kinds of responses really kind of, you know, bring people together. Okay. Hope I didn't. And if you've seen this before, then awesome. But it's about an hour. It's about a minute and, and 30 seconds, not an hour. <laughs> a minute and 30. On. So I will pick up right. Thank you, uh, Dina, for such an insightful presentation and I will pick up where Dina left off. So let me just Sminda. So um, why talk about communication, right? I, I just preface this by saying I'm going to give you a lot of information in 20 minutes. So just bear with me and inshallah whatever you can take, uh, I hope and, and pray it will be helpful. So Bismillah Rahman Rahim. So why are we talking about communication, right? Good and open communication is going to be a main ingredient in success of any marriage. It's kind of impossible for somebody to have a happy marriage or have a successful marriage if there isn't a healthy uh, communication taking place in that marriage. We often, you know, as a Muslim community, I'm assuming most of us on here are Muslims. If you're not, you're welcome on here. Uh, but most of us as a community, we, we take education seriously. And we will get masters and PhDs and all these degrees in our respective fields. But often when it comes to basic social skills, life skills, communication skills, we're still at an elementary level, right? And this is something that then needs work. So expert consensus and research both indicate that, so this is whether you ask psychologists or you look at studies, that happy couples communicate differently from unhappy couples. And this is not just a feeling or this is something that has been proven through research that if you observe uh, the communication of a happy couple versus unhappy couples or relationships that lead to divorce, you will see significant differences in the way they were speaking to each other and in the way they were com communicating. So just like there is a formula to succeed in school, there's a formula to succeed in the workplace. There's also a formula to succeed in communication and to succeed in your marriage, right? And the good news is that just like anything else, communication can also be learned, okay? So it doesn't, it's not a mystery. It's not something you have to be born with. You're not necessarily born a good communicator. It's something that takes knowledge and we're all capable of learning it. Okay, so I just want to quickly highlight 
uh, some facets of healthy communication versus unhealthy communication in a marriage, okay? So I'm not gonna go over all of them, but I'm just gonna leave the slide up for you to be able to see the difference. Um, and I like a few points. So if there's healthy communication in a marriage, people will feel free to talk openly and freely. They will feel safe sharing their feelings and their most private thoughts. When they speak to each other and they address each other, they will do so tactfully and sensitively, and they will listen. They will listen to the other person and try to understand the other person. But you find often with unhealthy communication is couples are still talking, but often the, com com um, the conversations are superficial. Like, oh, did you pick up the kids or did you get the groceries? And they're, the real conversations are very limited. People don't feel safe sharing their feelings. They fear that it will be met with hostility. Um, there is often not a lot of positive feedback and a lot of defensiveness and criticism and speaking over each other and making assumptions, right? So this is just to highlight some points. So to, to show that this is not made up stuff and that this is coming from research and statistics, the importance of communication, one of who he's considered like really like a marriage expert in the, in the Western world is Dr. Um, John Gottman and his wife, Julie Gottman. And a lot of the, the skills and the research that we're presenting, the credit goes back to them, right? Uh, often marriage and family therapists will, will receive training in the Gottman model. So here is over just different statistics. I'm not going to go over them, but they're here for you to see. Of over uh, 30 years of research observing 3,000 couples, over 3,000 couples, to see what aspects led to a successful marriage and what aspects of communication led to divorce. The one that I will point out is if you see the 5 to 1 and the 0.8 to 1 ratio. So Dr. Gottman observed that Couples who have happy marriages and successful marriages, when they're in conflict, there's a five to one ratio of positive interaction versus negative interaction versus um, relationships that end up in divorce or that where couples report, report being unhappy. There is a 0.8 to one ratio of positive interaction and negative interaction in conflict, meaning in conflict, positive interaction would be, do you feel heard? Um, is your spouse gentle with you? Do they grab your hand? And negative interaction would be eye rolls and speaking over the person or leaving the room while the person is, is accompanying. So you can see five to one, the positive to negative, there has to be five times more positivity than negativity for there to be healthy conflict resolution. Um, and inshallah, you'll have this chart to access later. So, um, what is so what we want to talk about today so obviously we have an hour and a half with you and there's only so much we can cover i'm going to cover a few skills very practical examples that you can begin to use that will teach you how to have attuned conversations another word for attuned conversation is intimate conversations um if uh, so studies show that when couples have more frequent attuned conversations it leads to marital satisfaction and it leads to um, healthier communication in the marriage. So what is an attuned conversation? It's when you are speaking to your spouse, you are really present, listening, and interested in your partner and connected with your partner. This is the opposite of superficial and disconnected conversations where we're just kind of talking past each other rather than to each other, right? And anyone can learn to have attuned conversations. Uh, you may be thinking like, my spouse is never gonna go for this or they're not even gonna try this. So the reason why people don't often wanna work on communication or work on emotional expression is because they believe it's going to be really difficult or it's gonna be a, a, a big challenge, but it's actually not. There are a few things, a few skills that we can easily learn. And if we begin to implement them right away, we will see a drastic uh, change in the quality of our marriage and the quality of our communications. And I just want to note that attuned conversations have to take place daily. They don't have to be about serious issues or controversial issues or always about conflict, but that there is at least one conversation on a daily basis where we're really tuning into each other, checking in, checking in with each other and being present. So the four skills that I'm going to cover with you for having a tuned conversation are the following. Learning to put your feelings into words, asking open-ended questions, the art of reflection, 
and expressing empathy. Okay, so we'll dive right in. So putting your feelings into words. So one of the things that you will realize is that, or that we have realized as therapists, is that many adults, unfortunately, don't know how to express their own feelings. Like, even though we're adults, you would think we'd know how, but many adults don't. And that's okay. There's no shame in not knowing. But the second we realize we don't know something, then it's something that we have to work on. So why don't we know how to express our own feelings? Because often we don't even know how to identify our own feelings. I can't tell you, I can't tell my spouse what I'm feeling if I myself don't know what I'm feeling, right? So a lot of us are disconnected from our own feelings. So identification precedes expression of feelings, right? And so you can see if I don't know what I'm feeling and I can't tell my spouse what I'm feeling, how am I going to emotionally connect to my spouse? So, um, I'm going to present a quick case study example and then tell you how a quick method for how you can learn to put your your feelings into words. So I had a, and obviously um, all names and, and confidential information, biographical information is changed to preserve confidentiality. So uh, but I had a 38 year old uh, divorced male client named Tariq. That's not his real name. It's all, all anonymous. Right. Or preserved confidentiality. Um, and Tariq really struggled with uh, emotional expression. Um, I noticed that in our sessions. He had two children who, who he had custody of, so they were living with him, and Tariq decided to get remarried. He met someone and he wanted to ma marry this woman. And he was struggling with, he didn't know how to tell his children. So the reason I'm giving you this example, it's not necessarily a marriage example, just to highlight the importance of emotional identification. So I kept asking Tariq, I kept, we kept going back to Tariq, how does it make you feel to tell your children that you met someone? And instead of identifying a feeling for me, Tariq kept rationalizing, right? He was like, well, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And I said, okay, but how does it make you feel to tell them? He said, well, I don't want to negatively affect their future. And I said, okay, well, how does it make you feel to tell them? And he said, well, if my parents did this to me, I know it would hurt me. And I said, and how does it make you feel to tell them that you have met someone, right? And he was really wanted me to just move past this. And I refused to move past this because I knew this was important for him. So finally, with some struggle, he yelled, he literally raised his voice and said, I'm feeling guilty, okay? That's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling guilty, right? So Tariq was feeling tremendous guilt in bringing this issue before his, his children, um, that he had met someone and he didn't want to, he was, he was feeling guilty about bringing about this major change in their life. Now that we identified the feeling, right? And I saw in his face, as soon as he said it, he just kind of like, like just took like, like he exhaled, right? Cause he, emotional identification is powerful. Now that we knew what he was feeling, we can actually get to work to addressing the feeling. We can talk about why the guilt, how we can reduce the guilt. Maybe the guilt is not valid, right? Whatever it may be. So a technique to teach you how to identify your, your, your own emotions. And this is for all of you that all of you can apply. If this is something you struggle with or if your spouse struggles with, if they're not here, you can go teach it to them. So to give credit, this technique called focusing is by Dr. Eugene Gendlin. And it's a technique for pinpointing emotions. So if you have some event happen to you, something happens that upsets you or that triggers you, you separate yourself from for a moment and you take a moment and you close your eyes and you tune into your own body. You try to go into your own heart and see what's happening. And what you do once, once you've taken a minute to tune into yourself, what you do is you, in your mind, run through a series of emotions and you're trying them out to see what fits. So am I feeling sad? Am I feeling frustrated? Am I feeling left out? Am I feeling hurt, right? And what you'll notice is as you go through all these feeling words, when you hit the word that you're feeling, your body, your body will immediately go, whew, like your body will immediately experience a release. Like when a puzzle piece, when two puzzle pieces come together and you hear that click, your body experiences like this click, right? And just this exercise in itself, like being able to label what I'm feeling is very health, very healing and very therapeutic. Now that I know what myself, what I'm feeling, I can go communicate it to others. And so what may help 
is if you Google, you can come up with like a thousand charts that are filled with feeling words, okay? Um, and you just save a photo of them in your phone. And if feeling words are not coming to you, you can pull up that chart and just run through and see which, which feeling it is. And I just, I thought this was a pretty example. So I, I shared this. Okay, and we don't have time for this. I wish we had time for everything, but I have 20 minutes, so we'll skip this and we'll go to skill number two. So number one was how to identify, uh, putting my feelings into words. Number two, this is very simple. Uh, uh, skill number two, which is asking open-ended questions. And this will not just help you be a better spouse. This will help you be a better friend, a better sibling, a better parent. This can be applied university, universally, but today we're talking about marriage, okay? So... Open-ended questions are the opposite of questions that yield yes or no answers. So we want to stay away from questions when we're really trying to engage our spouse or get into a conversation or really have them open up to us. We want to avoid questions that yield yes or no answers. They are called conversation killers. So some examples are, did you have a good day at work? Yeah or no, not really, right? Did the meeting go well? Mm hmm kind of, yeah. Did you like that show, right? Those are questions that yield yes or no answer. We wanna to learn to ask questions that deepen the conversation. And so I took the same topics, but just changed some of the verbiage, right? So how was your day at work today? Now I can actually tell you about my day at work today. Tell me about your big meeting today, how did that go, right? Uh, what was your favorite part about the show that we just watched or the movie that we just watched? So these are questions that are more thoughtful and they, they make a person want to open up to you more, right? And this can apply to day-to-day -day conversations and it can also apply to when you need to have more serious conversations where there is a greater need for emotional expression, right? So instead of asking, how many times have people asked you guys, are you okay? Like you look upset and they can tell you look upset and they're like, are you okay? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. Or no, I'm not. Yeah, I'm fine, right? Just try saying something is as simple as saying, you don't seem okay. Do you want to talk about it? Right? Just that, just acknowledging that you're seeing that the person's not okay. And then opening the door for them to tell you whatever is very powerful. Right? So this is just a skill number two, just learning to ask open-ended questions. And we do have time for Q&A at the end. So feel free to write down your questions and you can post them in the chat when we get to the Q&A part. I'm sure questions may come up. Skill number three is the art of reflection, okay? And this is also something that's very powerful and that, that deepens a conversation and a connection. So after I'm asking open-ended questions and my spouse starts telling me what's going on with them, especially if something that day has gone wrong or has upset them or it's bothering them, this is where reflection works great. Uh, it's called reflective uh, communication, right? All it is, all reflection is, is repeating back to your spouse what you heard from them in your own words, okay? And you may feel like a crazy person doing it, but I guarantee you it is so powerful and it's what the person needs from you. You reflect back content, meaning what, you, what the words that they're saying, and you can also reflect back for feelings. So you can listen and watch their body language for what they're telling you that they're feeling, even if they're not saying the word, and just reflect it back. And I'm going to give you an example in a second, right? When you reflect back to your spouse what you heard, what this does is it shows the person that you understand them. And this is, goes back to Dina's rule about understanding must precede advice. I don't need to jump straight into advising you or giving you my opinions. Before I do any of that, I'm going to first communicate to you, look, I got you, I understand you, I understand what you're going through. And this is very powerful. And you don't have to have the perfect words. Like, I'm going to share with you some words that you can use to start these sentence, but you just have this principle in mind that I'm going to reflect back, right? And you will find the words yourself. So I'm going to give you an example for the art of reflection. Uh, reflection. So obviously, the first example has an X next to it. The second example has a check mark next to it, right? So Imad comes back from a difficult day at work and he says to his wife, Hiba, business just isn't picking up. I don't know what else we can do. We've tried all types of marketing and it's so slow. And Hiba says, have you tried Facebook ads? I know those are popular. What about ads in the local newspaper? 
Now, Hiba's not being mean. Hiba's trying to be helpful and she is giving suggestions, but that's not the art of reflection. That's not reflecting back. So let's look at what reflecting back would look like. So Imad says the same things, the business isn't picking up, they've tried everything. And Hiba says, sounds like you're feeling frustrated that you've tried many options and nothing seems to be working. And that will cause the Imad to like, feel like, yeah, wow, Hiba gets it, right? Hiba gets that I'm frustrated and this isn't working. And you will notice when you do this, it will deepen the conversation with, the, with your spouse. It will make them like you more and it will make them feel heard and want to open up to you. And I had some longer examples that we just don't have reflections, uh, sorry, that we just don't have time for. But inshallah, if you get the PowerPoint, you guys will have those. So statements to begin reflecting can start with, it seems like you're, or what I guess I'm hearing you say is that, or it appears that you, or you're telling me that, right? Any of these statements are statements that we can use to begin reflecting just to have in our, in our um, toolbox, right? In our communication toolbox. And the last skill that I'm going to share with you is expressing empathy. And expressing empathy is just taking reflect, reflection to an even deeper level. And honestly, if you can just do this, and you, you've been having communication problems, I guarantee you it will improve your marriage. I guarantee you it will improve the quality of your communication. So when your partner is upset, you want to be on their team, even if they are wrong. Okay, this is very important. Even if you think they're wrong or you think that they're overreacting, you want to stifle, like literally bite your tongue for the urge to give your opinion and give your suggestions and just be on their teams. Being the voice of reason is not always wise. We always think, oh, I have like such great opinions and I can totally see why you're wrong. So I'm going to show it to you and let me help you like get the picture right. And the person is not in that moment. They're not looking for any of that. When a person is in their emotions, all they're looking to see is that you understand them, right? And that you are, you are their ally and you've got their back. And this may to you think like, you know, well in Islam or the Prophet ﷺ taught us to give advice and to give feedback. I'm not saying not give advice, but that comes later. In that moment when someone is upset, look, we wanna be effective, right? So if something is going to hurt or make a person take a step back from me, then that's not wise. And our religion is all about wisdom, right? So I want to make that person feel supported and hurt. No unsolic unsolicited advice. Just being there and listening is an enormous contribution. So be an ally more than a problem solver, right? And I will end with this example of expressing empathy. So Sana says to her husband, Rami, I just asked Mariam for a ride to the airport and she made a bunch of excuses and said she can't take me. I've noticed the last two times I've asked her for something, she always can't for some reason. Do you know how many favors I've done for her? I will change my plans if she really needs, needs me. Rami, the non-quotes part is what Rami is thinking to himself. He's thinking, I've seen Mariam be a good friend to Sana and I believe she really may have a reason, but he doesn't say that to Sana. He says to her, I've noticed you always go out of your way for your friends and it's disappointing when the same care is not reciprocated. I can see this hurts you, right? And even though in his mind he's seeing another side, in that moment he is validating her feelings and he's making her feel word, heard. Let the rest of the world correct us, right? Let's not, let's not be that for each other. The, uh, the same example of with an X on it is the second example. It's Mariam says the same thing and Rami says, how can you jump to such a conclusion? I'm sorry, Sana says the same thing. And Rami says, how can you jump to such a conclusion? Mariam is such a good friend to you, right? And Mariam may be a good friend to Sana and Sana may be being unreasonable, but that's not what she needs from her husband in that, in that moment. Um, so with that, uh, I hope we are okay on time, inshallah. Dina, give me a thumbs up. So I am going to stop sharing. And like I said, if you have questions, um, please jot them down and we are happy to answer them later. And I'm going to transition, inshallah, back to Dina now. You're on mute, Dina. Thank you. Welcome to the Zoom world, everyone. <laughs> it's always great to have someone uh, fix that piece. So Jazakallah khair. Um, actually, I'm gonna stop sharing this for just one quick second. 
um, I just want to really highlight, Uneza, that was amazing. I mean, all of those skills really, really, those are the things. It's, it's so interesting because it's everything that we can be doing. And like you highlighted earlier, there are things that we can learn and we can practice. Um, so that, that really see kind of the difference of everything she was saying to do was the opposite of what I had presented. And hers is the right one. <laughs> So we will, uh, it's now time for Q&A and we just have a short amount of time left. So if you want to go ahead and um, type them up in the chat, um, Dina and I will go ahead and, and we will answer them. There's no questions. I did receive one question privately. Um, it says, how and where to start a conversation when there has been eight plus years of marriage in, in the marriage, when there's been eight plus years of marriage miscommunication or lack of communication, but, but both couples want to change and start over. Um, the first, so this was asked privately. So the first thing that comes to my mind is honestly just sitting down together. And obviously, like those of you who are here with your spouses, I saw a few husbands next to the wife that... I will say that if you take these techniques and you go start applying them by yourself, you will, you will experience a difference. When both people commit together that we are both going to together work on this as a team, um, there, it's never too late. It's just acknowledging, look, this is the way it's been so far, but we know it's not working and we know both of our needs are not being fulfilled. So let's together make a commitment to each other and start practicing some of these skills and maybe just pick one. You know, just to, let's both be more empathetic towards each other. Let's both try the reflecting and not as much advising or, or giving of opinions, whatever it may be. Committing to one, and this is to Dina's point when we were struggling putting the chats, um, uh, that you know what you'll find, like for example, so the skills with, that we shared, they seem really simple. They are simple. What's hard is that if you are 25 years old, 30 years old, 35 years old, and you've been talking one way your whole life, it's really hard to now like begin to communicate a different way. But if you're intentional about it, right? It's like anything else. At first, it, it's like a muscle, right? That hasn't been built. So if I want to nod, for those of us who are used to quickly advising and giving opinions, right? And we just immediately jump to that, that um, that's just my go-to. So making this conscious effort that no, this entire month, I'm going to practice no opinions, no advice. I'm just going to reflect back. Then that will, thing will become easier for you till the point where it begins to come, come naturally from you. So that's what I would say. Just make the intention that we're going to start now and it's never too late. Um, I don't know if there's another question you want to answer, Dina. There's a question in the chat. Okay, so with regards to um, having different communication styles, and sometimes, yes, that can definitely be a struggle. And there are, we know that there are different communication styles. Um, one of the things that we've, we've seen, I mean, obviously, um, Uneza and I both work and, you know, we, we, we work with couples in different capacities. Um, and so sometimes um, couples will reach out to, to someone who can sort of help facilitate the process. And so sometimes that's a therapist. Uh, and the, the purpose is to really allow them to hear each other and facilitate the conversation so that each of them can get the skills techniques of how to talk to the other person. Similar to love languages, if any of you are familiar with those, people have different ways of expressing and receiving love. And it's when we're not matching the other person, there's a disconnect, which can create conflict. So if both partners are on the same page with the intention of, okay, like we really care about each other. We, you know, we want to improve our communication skills. Sometimes it's trying a different approach. And also when receive, like when getting feedback, um, it's easy for us to interpret feedback or interpret information that's given to us based on our communication style. So if I'm more, um, if I'm if I'm a direct communicator and someone is responding or someone is you know giving me information indirectly, the direct communicator may see it as like, okay, what's why can't they just say what they mean? Why can't they just say it? And if there's an indirect communicator and a and direct computer kid, they may view them as like, wow, they're so harsh. They're so insensitive. Like, why don't they get it? Why can't they be a little bit more caring? Where it doesn't have anything to do with that. So 
awesome step one that that um, the, the best part of step one is realizing that there's two different communication styles. And then step two is being able to um, better understand the other persons and being able to check in with questions. So sometimes even using an I statement of like, you know, I hear you saying this. And when this is said, this is how I feel or this is how I hear it to allow for that space of like, how can we better form, you know, how can we better understand each other's communication style so that we're being more effective with the other person? It doesn't even necessarily need both people to be on the same page, but one person does have to take that, like they have to take charge and be intentional, like Uniza said, um, for that change to happen. Because once one person shifts, like once one aspect of a dynamic shifts, the whole dynamic is different. So there's always hope. And then tapping into resources and professionals who can help if it's something that is, you know, that may need a little bit more than that that's available too. There's one more question, I think, Oniza. I It's 3.34, Dina, and I see people are leaving. So I think it's good to wrap up. People have their schedules. So thank you guys so much. We know an hour and a half is literally just like tapping um, you know, the icing and, and just like tapping at a very surface level. Um, but inshallah, we have three more. Um, you will get the dates for the future ones coming up. Um, honestly, just one of these things we could spend six hours talking about, but we want to thank you guys so much for joining. There will be a survey that you'll receive in the email. Please, please fill it out. Uh, we need your feedback to do, uh, to improve upon what we're doing and to meet the needs. I just want to uh, share again, you know, Dina um, shared about Peaceful Family Projects. This is an amazing organization that does work that I haven't really seen um, too many organizations within the nationally in the U.S. doing. So please support this cause, donate to them. Um, they do uh, a lot of domestic violence prevention and awareness and imams training. Just the list is endless. And most of the 70% of the programming and almost all of the resources that are provided to communities, they're free, right? So they're coming from somewhere. They're people's time, effort, and money. So your generous contribution will help like um, us allow to be able to provide the resources and provide um, the trainings and events that are very much needed. Today was a brief, today was a small cost, but often these events are for free. Um, so this is really, you know, to bring peace and love and harmony and remove abuse from homes is such a such a um, important cause, and so I'm sure you guys can understand. So please donate generously, and inshallah, we have all of your email addresses and contacts now. So we'll be in touch. Um, and share any future programming. Dina and Sara, is there anything I'm forgetting to mention? Okay, uh, all right. In terms of whether the slides are going to be shared. Uh, well, they will receive a recording and the recording has the presentation. So um, I don't know if we'll, we'll decide whether to specifically share the slides, but you will receive a recording of the, the lecture part of the presentation. We're not going to share the interactive part just for your privacy, but you'll receive the lecture part. And I'm sorry we weren't able to get to, to all the questions. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, take care. All the best. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, everyone.